Welcome ladies and gents, Chris Andre here. Thank you first and foremost for all your lovely messages. I'm back now, I do apologize for the delay in this video. Of course, when you have a family emergency, that stuff has to come before boxing. I appreciate everybody's understanding and interest in the channel. Let's talk about the massive fight that took place over the course of the weekend. Terence Crawford slaying the big fish, Errol Spence Jr. I've put together some clips here and there to show you exactly how I believe this occurred, you know, the key areas that led to the victory. For those of you that saw the preview, you'll know that I was picking Bud Crawford to win the fight by a stoppage. I felt that he would have too many moments of excellence to be able to time Errol, make him fall short, and be able to get him out of there. However, I didn't expect it to be as dominant as it was. I felt that Spence would have been the guy through activity to be able to build up somewhat of a lead, and Bud would need those moments of excellence, need to time him, need to find out the patterns, and then take him out. Otherwise, I wouldn't be stunned if Spence was able to survive a late onslaught, cross the finish line, and win the fight on points. But it was a lot more dominant than I expected it to be. Having said that, whilst I didn't expect it to be that dominant, I could see, even pre-fight, a path in which it could be a dominant display for Bud Crawford. Because, as I said in the preview, there were specific areas that each guy had to win if he was going to have a chance of winning the fight. For Errol Spence, as we said in the preview, he had to win the lead hand contest. His jab had to be more successful than the jab of Bud Crawford and the lead hand control of Bud. We spoke about how Bud uses that lead hand to affect an opponent's construct and to dictate distance. If he's not able to dictate distance and Spence is able to come inside, well then, the key area which Bud has to be able to cope with is use his physical strength in order to be able to tie up and nullify Errol Spence on the inside. Apart from being unbelievably physically strong, as we've said, he's also got that Greco-Roman wrestling background, and that enables him to understand leverage, affecting construct, pinning limbs, and stuff like that. And if Spence was too big, too strong for Bud to be able to do that, then he better be able to have the feet to be able to keep away from Spence and make him lunge with that deep step jab that he throws in order to be able to counter that. So if either guy failed on those areas, he would be in serious trouble. Well, Bud won every single one of those chess battles. It was Bud's lead hand that was dominant. It was Bud that was able to nullify Errol Spence on the inside and tie him up. It was Bud that was able to use his superior footwork against that linear moving lead long jab of Errol Spence to bring that backhand into play and he was able to to work against that and expose it you know a lot of people will find this surprising but there's an element of Deontay Wilder that sort of the methodology of entry is not too dissimilar to that of Errol Spence's it's that long lead jab where the feet maximize their range from each other it's a wide base you enter via, via a wide base and as you're uh, weight is distributed onto that front foot you're setting up to throw that backhand now Spence obviously a southpaw Wilder's orthodox Wilder tends to throw the backhand to the head with Spence he tends to mix it up he can throw it to the head or he can throw it to the body and from there he'll look to collapse the pocket and he's brilliant on the inside Wilder doesn't really have an inside game but he can clean you out from range so I'm not saying they're the same at all I'm simply saying the methodology of entry is very similar and Tyson Fury was able to spot that against Deontay Wilder in the second fight. And he was able to take half a step back every time Wilder would take that deep step jab. And he would throw his arms up to provide this, this um, barrier as he's stepping away diagonally. So that right hand would come over and it would land and uh, so it was on the shoulders or biceps as he's stepping away and he'd take it away from him. In the third fight, when Fury's legs weren't quite the same anymore and he didn't quite move the same way he used to, he flipped it on his head and instead of moving backwards, he started to move forward to smother the long right hand of Deontay Wilder before its full rotation. Well, Bud Crawford implemented those two things in the same fight. He knew when to step away and when to collapse the pocket. And in addition to that, he understood apart from range and how to affect and take away Errol Spence's jab and that approach that he would use to whip in that backhand. He also understood positioning and angles. And almost like a puppeteer pulling the strings, he was able to recognize, right, from this position, I know that Spence can only throw one of two punches. So if I protect against both of those with my hand positioning and with my exit point or entry point, if I'm going to collapse the pocket, then I know I'll stay safe. So let's look at some footage to show you exactly what it is that I'm talking about. Let's get into this and look at the way Bud slayed the big fish. We'll start off looking at Spence's jab. You see how he really steps deep, that, that thing that I was talking about? It's a maximum reach. And that means that when you do that, all your weight goes onto that front foot. 
And that puts you in a position whereby you have committed in a linear fashion, a linear progression. And I know this is a much lower level. I've already spoken about the Deontay Wilder, but I know this is a much lower level. But this is what Jake Paul does to get his backhand off too. Obviously, I'm not comparing Jake Paul to any elite fighter in terms of execution or ability. I'm simply explaining that the methodology of bringing the backhand into play has its limitations and that was why I was picking Tommy Fury to beat him because Tommy has good lateral movement for a guy of that level well for a guy of this level significantly higher level we know that Bud has that movement too and you can see he takes these little hop steps back and sometimes it makes Errol fall short as you saw there he had to reset other times Bud will hold his feet and then come straight back at Errol Spence and that's actually what caused the knockdown Spence's inability to adjust quickly enough once he put that weight onto that front foot now in the past he'd actually been very good at pulling out and you saw that against the likes of Mikey Garcia and Danny Garcia he was much faster at doing that now is that because of a slight decline in Errol Spence we'll talk about that later on or is it simply because with Bud's movement Errol felt that he had to be lunging even more taking more risks to overreach in order to get to him so that was one key area that had to be won by Errol Spence and he wasn't able to win it because of the way that deep step and wide stance would marry up against the footwork and lateral movement of Bud Crawford. But there was also another physical aspect that played a role and that was Bud's physical strength. I did mention that the actual physicality and his ability to potentially nullify Spence on the inside was vital for him. We saw that Spence is often using a bump. He gets low and bumps you with the shoulder in order to get you off balance and he goes to work from there. He likes to break your construct. And I showed you how he does that against your Dennis Ugas. But if you look at this first clip, for instance, you'll see how when he bumps Terence Crawford, it does not have the desired physical effect. He bumps him there and Bud did not really move and he wasn't even in a position where he had these legs as, uh, as a wider base for you to say okay he had the leverage he just had this natural physical strength and he was then able to tie up Errol Spence we also spoke how with Avenisian Bud was able to just push him away at times and would he be big enough and strong enough to be able to do that with Errol Spence well in this particular clip you actually see some really good work from Spence on the inside he lands an uppercut then a left hook and from this position you just see Bud just nudges him away. And then in this last one, Spence tries to get low and he gets lent on basically and just cannot push back Terence Crawford. So from a sheer physical strength perspective, there was also a gap there. Beyond just Bud's physical strength though, there's also a very high level inside game which stems from Greco-Roman wrestling, his ability to really pin an opponent's arms, to know how to generate leverage, to know how to affect and manipulate the opponent's construct, and we'll show you examples of that. But even beyond that, there's also this point of anticipation that he's capable of. He realizes, just like a puppeteer pulling the strings, that when Spence is in X position, he can only throw one or two particular punches. So if I expect those punches to come, I can defend against them and then there's nothing Spence can do and this is what high level fighters do it's like playing chess and they're two or three moves ahead so let's look at a couple of examples here here Spence actually gets Bud up onto the ropes it's exactly where he wants him Bud's caught a little square on here this is not really a position he wants to be in but he lowers his body he puts his chin over the shoulder of Errol Spence and hugs that right arm and then hooks the elbow of Errol Spence just to hug him just to stop him from working and that's where the physical strength comes into play again but he's able to lock up the arms of Errol Spence to ensure nothing's coming his way here as you see Errol Spence does what he typically does that jab upstairs and then he's looking to collapse the pocket and come inside Bud instantly turns the shoulder off so there's nothing central here that Spence can aim for the back is available but what are you going to do you're not allowed to hit him in the back you can try and hook the arm around him to grab him and pull him in but you can see how his right arm's very well placed to control the the head of Errol Spence he's protecting his chin as well and he's giving him the shoulder there's no method through here that comes from Errol Spence ripping the torso or the solar plexus of Bud Crawford. And then from there, he lifts up the elbow just enough in the throat to push Errol Spence away and get the leverage that he needs. 
From that next attack, you saw that Errol Spence seeks to engage with the jab and it's parried down. And instantly from here, he knows, again, the only area that he can attack from is that backhand. If he's going to throw a punch, it'll be from that backhand because after he steps in with that jab and he drops it low, he's either going to bump me with his body or throw that shot. That's his game. That's his position. So what does Bud do? He turns slightly off at an angle and he's protecting the side of that head. Spence realizes this. So rather than try and come in with that punch, he engages but seeks to open up the body to come with a right hook. And Bud Crawford then seeks to just tuck up and lean towards that right hand. You see how he's leaning over to his own left hand side? This is to smother the shot. This is to prevent full rotation of that hook and to protect his ribs. And you can see when it does land, it's sort of like a cupping shot. He can't get around to land to the head of Bud Crawford who now collapses the pocket completely and gets right up close to smother. There's not much Spence can do from here. He's tied up. Up. he's wrapped up from here you see Errol Spence again seeks to engage with that lead jab brings the backhand into play it gets caught essentially around the, the ribs he's holding it and look at the way he's leaning again towards his own left hand side it's because he knows the only punch Errol Spence can throw from here is that right shovel hook so let me protect the ribs let me protect the side of my head lean in towards it so that he can't even get full rotation to hit me on the arms and shoulders and for it to hurt He's not going to be able to generate much on that shot. And I'll lean in there, rip off my own little uppercut into the body. It will create separation. Spence has got what he wants now. This is separation. But I'm going to come downstairs underneath that jab and enter the pocket. I've collapsed it further. So as he seeks to throw that backhand again after that jab, typical Errol Spence type of move, I'm going to get inside the wheelhouse of that full rotation to smother him again. Great understanding of distance. Great understanding of how to smother. Now we start to see other examples, for instance, where he starts to anticipate the, that sort of thing. Now, as I've explained, because he likes that deep step jab with the backhand, that's quite a linear attack. It's a straight line. So if he was to throw it from here, he'd step that foot forward, throw the jab here, and the backhand would come directly in line with the chin of Bud Crawford. He's a little bit far out, but that's the line of attack. So I want you to watch what Spence does to try and change the line of attack by watching his back leg. Look at his back leg. See what the angle of his positioning. See how he swings it around there? The moment he swings it around, think of the new line of attack. So here, it's a straight line, say, from the shoulder, coming across here. As he comes across there, he changes the angle. Now it would come at this angle rather than at that angle. So what does Bud do? Anticipating this, understanding Spence's linear attacks, he offers his head. See that? He just rocks forward and offers his head. And the minute he comes into range, he steps back because he realizes I'm offering him bait. He parries the jab from Spence and then covers up. And there's nothing on for Spence here. He can throw the backhand, but it will be towards the shoulder. The face is covered. And from there, he's now eaten enough counter shots to be concerned about just going for it. Here's another example. Bud throws the hook. He lands on Spence and he takes a little step back. This discombobulates Spence a little bit. Look at the back leg of Errol Spence. He's going to have to readjust it in a moment. So Bud, realizing he's not got his balance, throws an uppercut. And from there, he understands. In this position here, Spence is lent over. The only possible thing he can do is throw the right hook. The left arm's pinned. There's nothing he can do. The leverage comes from here. So what does he do? You see how he's lent again towards that side to smother, to stop full rotation for Errol Spence's hook. And what does he go on to do from there? He puts his arm up and starts to step back before Spence even throws the shot. There's the arm from Bud. He's anticipated it and he starts to step away. And I spoke about uh, Golovkin doing this to Canelo in the second fight when I did a, a, a preview to the third Canelo Golovkin fight. And I was talking about how Triple G was able to stay on the edge of range and do this to Canelo and he in my opinion he definitely won that second fight but these are the things the little things that people don't see and they don't realize why a guy is falling short it's not that Spence isn't letting go of the shot effectively it's just that Bud realizes it's the only shot he can throw from that position so I'm going to move before he even throws it it's like fighting a ghost again here that forward lead hand comes from Bud Crawford affecting the eyesight of Errol Spence, looking to control the forehead if he is to come in. And so what does he do? He tries to come underneath it to lead with a wide shovel hook. And look at it again. Tucked up, leaning towards the shot to stop the full rotation of it. And then he's able to tie him up. In this next clip, you see a counter jab from Bud. Then he throws a little uppercut inside the solar plexus. He's in a position here where he's trying to control Spence. 
and he realizes that the only possible shot that can come from this position is that hook and we spoke in the preview about bud's ability to take that little hop step back and then counter there it is there bang in this next clip you see the lovely jab lands from spence and as he seeks to step in bud realizes that backhand's coming that's his method of operation just like fury realized versus wilder and what does he do he dips with his left shoulder towards his own left side to smother any potential hook that's going to come so the backhand comes over the head the hook is smothered and as he exits look at the positioning of his hand because he knows that's the only possible shot that can come in from Errol Spence. In the next clip, again the backhand comes, look at where his hand was. He sees the throwaway jab, and as he's stepping back, he's thrown that arm up to prevent Errol Spence from being able to land anything. Another jab, again you see how he's loading up with that backhand. In fact, I'm going to let you see this in full speed, this last clip. Look at the way he will realize the punch is coming from that angle, so he steps to his own left, and he makes Bud Spence miss. There, just there. It's lovely anticipation, it's lovely control of the opponent. And for those of you that did see the preview, you'll remember that I was saying how you can surprise Bud Crawford with the first shot when you're inside the pocket, but he quickly adjusts and it makes it very difficult to land combinations or second phase of attacks on him. And as you can see here from Nate Latshaw talking about the data regarding the fight, he says in a combination punch and review of Spence Crawford, high fidelity CompuBox data allows us to quantify combinations. Spence's combination efficiency was low. He struggled to land consecutive punches. After a slow start, Crawford matched Spence's output and was more efficient. So these are the things that we said we expected to see and they did indeed play out. It was just even more dominant than even I could have anticipated. A wonderful fighter who's a chess player that sees one or two moves ahead of his opponent. Because this video is dragged on, I'm going to do a separate video and we're going to talk about the ceiling of Bud Crawford. Where does he go from here? How far could he actually go? I also want to talk a little bit about Errol Spence because there are some concerns that have been voiced by various people regarding the health of Errol Spence and whether he's still that same guy. So we're going to do those in a separate video with regards to this one. This was the methodology of how Terence Crawford put in a historic performance and slayed the big fish. Let me know what you think, ladies and gents. Please don't forget to hit a stiff jab on the like button, the right cross the subscribe button and an uppercut on the notifications button thanks for watching chat to you soon take care god bless